Welcome to today's live talk, the latest in a series of expert dialogues brought to you by Bayer. Our topic today is fighting hunger and ensuring food security in times of crisis. And that topic could not be more timely. My name is Melinda Crane Rose, and it is a great honor to accompany you today as moderator. The Russian invasion of Ukraine threatens lives far beyond the region itself. Often referred to as Europe's breadbasket, Ukraine shipped around 33 million tons of wheat in 2021 alone and has long fed large swathes of the Middle East and East Africa. With the war sparking uncertainty about both planting and shipping of this year's crop, wheat prices are soaring at a rate that is likely to equal or exceed the massive 30% hike that occurred last year. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization is warning that this could tip an already vulnerable food system toward disaster and put achievement of the Sustainable Development Goal Zero Hunger at risk. That goal was thought to be attainable at the time the world community signed up to it in 2015, but currently 800 million people worldwide, more than 10% of the global population, do not have enough food. Estimates made even before the latest crisis in Ukraine indicate that we are likely to miss the zero hunger goal by a margin of nearly 660 million people. Today, we want to explore the causes and the possible solutions to this urgent global challenge with two guests who bring to the discussion a wealth of knowledge and experience on food systems at risk. Ertharin Cousin is member of the Supervisory Board of Bayer AG and founder and CEO at Food Systems for the Future. From 2012 to 2017, she was Executive Director of the United Nations World Food Program and today is one of the world's most renowned agricultural economists. She advises governments and companies on how to improve world nutrition. She joins us today from Chicago. Absolutely wonderful to have you with us, Earth Ring Cousin. Good morning. Delighted to Good be morning. here. Good morning. Great, great that you could join us. And also with us is Matthias Banninger. He's a regular on these live talks. He's Bayer's Executive Vice President for Public Affairs, Science, Sustainability, and health, safety, and environment. And he was the driving force behind the company's global sustainability initiative, which seeks to preserve biodiversity and support the corporate ambition of helping more people, quote unquote, thrive within planetary boundaries. He joins us today from Washington, DC. Welcome, Matthias. Good morning and happy Friday. Thank you so much. Before we start the discussion, dear ladies and gentlemen, just a quick note on how you can take part in our exchange. Please use the comment function on this live stream to send us your questions and short comments, and I will bring them in a little bit later on. So I would like to begin uh, with the conflict in Ukraine, uh, given its impact on global food security. And Earthrin, the World Food Program, which, uh, as I said, you formerly headed, is issuing dire warnings of an impending food crisis in the Middle East and possibly beyond. We are seeing divergent predictions about the severity of this food uh, shortage. What's your sense of how grave it could become and also whether the world is adequately prepared to deal with mounting hunger? Well, the, you stated it in your opening, even before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, the world was suffering from high food prices. We were witnessing the a hundred uh, a, a a hundred million people increase in the number of people in the number of those who are chronically food insecure. And as David Beasley, the executive director of the World Food Program, had warned us before the the um, the invasion that forty three three million people in 45 countries around the world were living on the verge of famine. This isn't the first time that we've witnessed a situation where the, the a high food price crisis has resulted in a hunger crisis. But in 2008, when we saw an additional 300 million people added to the roles of, hungry, of the hungry, when food prices spiked in a significant significant manner, 
we were in a different world. We weren't facing COVID where high food prices, as you noted, have affected so many around the globe along with the health crisis. Nor were we uh, in a situation where we had these protracted conflicts, Yemen, Syria, Northeast Nigeria, creating significant numbers of hungry people where the WFP does not have the, the financial resources available to meet the hunger needs of those who are affected by the conflict, creating the famine-like conditions that we're seeing, that we're witnessing in so many of these places. And now, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and 30% of the wheat uh, that is produced on an annual basis affected by that conflict, as you noted, we're seeing a significant uh, increase in the price of food. But that doesn't create the perfect storm that will drive hundreds of millions of more people into hunger. That serves as a tipping point. The because the other the the additional issues, the issues of high prices and unavailability of fertilizer, high gasoline prices, the uh, the implementation of export bans and restrictions by net net exporting food uh, food countries affecting the availability of food and net importing food countries, these factors and others coming online together are now creating that crisis that like we, many would argue we've never seen before. I would argue we indeed have seen the symptoms, these indicators before. And we, um, in the past, we, uh, <clears throat> address this challenge in the in the aftermath of the increase in hunger. What we have today is a situation where we can see the perfect storm forming, where we can identify the challenges and those who will be affected. We are in a position right as we speak today, where if the world work together on concerted pathways forward, we can avoid those in, the, an increase in hundreds of millions of hungry people. Thank you. And we want to come back to that and also tap into your direct experience in dealing with previous hunger crises. Let me let me go to Matthias and ask you, considering what we've just heard, what short term measures you think could help diminish the impact of this conflict on the global food system and how, if at all, we can help people in Ukraine, including the farmers who normally would soon be sowing their fields? I think um, peace is always important. Peace in the Ukraine is, I think, what we really need. Um, and uh, we need to hope that this senseless war will end um, sooner than many people expect at the moment, because that would enable farmers in Ukraine uh, to basically get the crop on the ground. Um, what we are doing at the moment is we are preparing for this event, because we would not want to be in a situation where suddenly there is an opportunity to go back into planting, but the diesel is missing, the crop protection products are missing, the seeds aren't where they need to be, there isn't enough logistical support by way of trucks. So I think for the European Union, the German government, one of the most important things is to prepare for a scenario that would allow planting in the months of April and in the months of May that would reduce the crisis. We have heard the Ukrainian agriculture minister at the G7 agriculture meeting a week ago, uh, basically saying, look guys, um, we see a systematic destruction of food relevant infrastructure in my country. So even in that situation, Ukraine's output will be not nearly where it would have been uh, without Putin's decision to invade a sovereign country and inflict so much harm. So. We still need Ukraine. Um, and uh, there is a lot of grain stored in the Ukraine at the moment that David Beasley needs because he had been betting on shipping that grain into Yemen, into other parts of Africa, in order to fight a hunger crisis that currently affects 43 million people that are right at the edge of famine. So they are not food insecure, they are starving. And um, he can't get access. To, to these uh, to these uh, grains at the moment, so that that's that's a big problem in the very concrete and the very acute. 
However, the knock-on effects of this crisis will be felt anyway. Those friends spoke about fertilizers. Yeah. Fertilizers basically secure 40% of the world's harvests. And we have seen fertilizer production going down, first last year as a result of China trying to uh, reallocate natural gas to other means. And now we see it as a result of this crisis. And as the gas crisis in Europe is going to increase, fertilizer production will go down. And without fertilizer, we have dramatically lower yields. There was an experiment last year in Sri Lanka where a government decided, let's do away with fertilizers. Let's just try to feed our population without that. Let's move into agroecology. And the experiment failed miserably. Sri Lanka became a vast net importer of food because without fertilizers, the yield's just not there. So this is really a very dire situation. Um, peace will reduce the pressure on food systems, but even peace today will no longer uh, kind of completely take the pressures away. Thank you very much. And just a very quick follow up, because you mentioned a concrete number that diverges to some degree from some of the other numbers that we're hearing. As I, hearing. As I said, the, the predictions of how widespread and how severe this crisis could be uh, do diverge. Can you tell us, Matthias, what, what you're currently uh, predicting or what you think is likely, both in terms of the affected countries and regions, as well as the numbers we're talking about? What I find very important is that we talk about the people affected and not about wheat futures and all the other yeah. economic data, which is, I think, uh, one of the problems in that debate. Um, in your introduction, you talked about the 800 plus million people that face food insecurity. Then there is roughly 280 million people that face uh, a more severe shortage of food. And there's the 43 million people that are actually at the verge of starvation. And when you look at hunger, you need to kind of have those three um, uh, uh, data points uh, on your radar screen. And my fear, based on fertilizer output that I see, based on La Nina, which is a climate phenomenon that, that kind of creates drought conditions uh, in places like China, in North Africa, in the United States, it has basically led to the third winter drought in a row in the center of Europe, in Hungary. Um, when you put all of that together um, uh, and you look at all of those factors, then I believe that we, we should prepare ourselves for a situation where the people in food insecurity will almost double from 280 uh, a million to half a billion. And that is a staggering number that would basically create a food insecurity crisis uh, that we've never seen before. I have only Thank one you. hope, and that is to be wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Let me go back to Earthrin. You're welcome to weigh in on that point if you like, but I'd also like to get a bit more uh, sense of your personal connection to this uh, topic going back to the time when you were at the World <laughs> Food Program. Conflict uh, is, of course, one of the most frequent and critical drivers of hunger crises, and that was certainly something that you experienced during your tenure <laughs> at WFP. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and how it shaped your thinking about hunger? Well, Thank you. That's such a, a, a emotional topic because when when you are working to feed some um, eighty five million pe billion million people per year, say eighty five million people per year, as we were during my time at the World Food Program. And uh, when I began that work, 20% of the people that we were supporting were, were victims of conflict and 80% were uh, suffered from hunger as a result of um, acute uh, crises such as earthquakes, floods, uh, droughts, and chronic hunger from lack of resilience in populations. By the time I left my post at WFP, we'd, that number had reversed. 
and 25 to 30 percent of the people that we were that we were supporting on an annual basis were 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 affected by acute uh, crisis, the the types that I described. And it's 65 to 80 percent of those that we were supporting, depending on the year, were of the victims of conflict. And so recognizing that the number of people that were acutely hungry in the world were were the victims of a conflict was was not only challenging for my staff, the team and I to work, but it was challenging for the people that we served because with a conflict, it is impossible to support your own food assistance. Farmers don't farm when bombs are falling. And so the, the work that you can do in a natural disaster, you, you know that once the once the rains come, that you can plant seeds. And as Matias said, it's only when the bombs stop that you can plant seeds. And after what my my work, we, we, we would argue and we would implore the world for peace to address the challenges of conflict. But what it forced me to do was more research around the issues of does hunger create conflict? And does, because we, as you noted, we know conflict creates hunger, but the data would suggest no direct correlation, no direct causation between hunger and conflict. There's always a correlation between hunger and conflict. It is always, as I like to say, one of the factors in the car. But when when there are there's a high food price crisis that creates hunger, we know there's a direct relationship between acute high food prices and and community instability, riots, protests, and ultimately conflict. There is a wide body of literature that would suggest that the high food price crisis cre was a, was the driver of the Arab Spring. We know that in 2008, the con the 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 high food price quite hunger crisis resulted in riots in 40 cities across the globe. And just this week, when the Secretary General announced a new task force addressing to address the issues of hunger, fuel, and finance. So, he specifically warned the world that we are seeing the sowing of the seeds of instability that have now been driven. And as I said earlier, that tipping point has now begun. We've now reached that tipping point because that would drive a high food price, hunger crisis that could create that instability, that conflict across the world. So we're no longer simply talking about food security. We're talking about security. And indeed, just mm -hmm. this past weekend, we saw uh, we saw protests in the streets in Iraq where the those who work could no longer afford bread. Because one the reason the difference between um, a a a the hunger and a high food price driven hunger crisis is that it's not just the chronically poor who can no longer afford food it becomes the working class those people who are accustomed to feeding their own children who can no longer afford bread who take to the streets yeah and I think many of us will remember that there are a number of major political crises, including the Arab Spring, that began uh, with uh, with protests about bread prices. Matthias, uh, the theme of food security and food supply has also been a constant throughout your really entire career, both in politics and also uh, in in the private sector. What what drives that interest? I think that uh, at one point during uh, med cow disease, I realized how most people take food for granted. And when I say most people, I'm talking about the people in the developed world. I'm talking about the people that live in the very wealthy parts of the world. Um, the fragility of food systems, which I think uh, is very, very clear 
for a majority of the world population and existentially clear for the smallholder farmers who are often the backbone of nutrition for the poorest people in the world is just not on our radar screen. And Özran and I, we've been in Munich at the Munich Security Conference just before the war broke out. And there were conversations about guns and conversations about gas. There were no conversations about grain or only the experts who always think about it thought about the topic. David Beasley was there. Of course, he talked about that topic. Jem uh, uh, Özdemir was there. He talked about the topic. But most people didn't have that on their radar screen. And my biggest fear is that we are so worried about our cars and we are so worried about our level of um, um, uh, 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 of kind of supply that we lose sight of the fragility of the food system. Once you are hooked up with how fragile the food system is, you just can't let go of this problem. And that's why I'm so passionate about it. Thank you. Um, Erthrin, you gave us uh, some of the sort of overall context of uh, the security crisis of which food is one dimension, uh, as you essentially uh, as you essentially explained it. But can I ask you uh, to drill just a bit deeper on that? Because I think for many of us, uh, there's a kind of a, a paradox in this that I wonder if you could perhaps help explain. Past decades have actually seen millions of people emerge from poverty, and yet hunger remains a widespread problem. And I know it's complex, but maybe you can give us a thumbnail version of why that is and what are the three main reasons that people don't have enough to eat. We've talked about conflict and that nexus, and we're also going to talk about the climate change nexus, but maybe just your view on that. Why are people still hungry in the world? The reality is that we have the the most vulnerable people living in some of the most vulnerable places around the globe and they live in places where the uh, our climate crisis that has already begun has uh, affects their ability to farm enough food and to har to farm and harvest enough food to meet the food needs and financial needs of their families and as a result they don't have enough to eat they uh, after the harvest comes in, they they sell it, and before the next planting season, they're too often lacking the resources that are necessary to support their families. And we know that the farmers in rural areas are some of the poorest people in the on the entire globe. We have 500 smallholder farmers, and far too many of them are subsistence farmers because not only are they affected by the fact when the rains don't come, they can't sow enough crops for their families. But they also lack, because of those that that financial challenge, the access to the seeds and tools that to seeds and inputs that are required to maximize the value of their the their of their harvest of their of their sowing. And you heard um, Matthias talk about this before: the challenge of lack of access to food. So that is that uh, that lack of access to inputs and the effect that that has on what is harvested. So the 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 first and foremost, we have lack of resiliency in the, the 500 million smallholder, smallholder farmers across the globe affecting their ability to provide enough food for their families throughout the entire year. That is one major driver of hunger across the globe. We talked about the challenge of conflict and the number of those who are who are both acutely as well as chronically food insecure because of what have now become what I what we call protracted conflicts or protracted emergencies, as I've seen printed recently in the description of Yemen. And as a result, we those populations remain hungry. We also know that there are the, the populations across the globe without access to land or to income or to jobs. And as a result, those populations are hungry 
and the investment in development that we often talk about to support the adaptation and the provision of land and the production of that land in a manner that will allow us to increase the productivity of, of food to provide enough food, enough diverse food to feed the entire population, that investment doesn't come when the when those who are who are affected by the lack of access to capital would require the the those resources and so lack of access to capital for the extremely poor lack of resilience for populations that farm on a regular basis but don't have the resources that are necessary and then the ongoing driver of conflict those create the chronic hunger that we too often see and so the what you are hearing now from agricultural economists across the globe is that our food system, as Matthias has said, is, is quite vulnerable to the climate crisis. And, but our food system also creates 25% of the greenhouse gases that are emitted on an yeah. annual basis. And so our failure as a global community to recognize the, the fragility of the food system, to invest the capital in, in, in adaptation, to support the transformation of our food system, not just in the U.S. and Europe, but across the entire global community to support those who farm, is not just to, to the hunger crisis, of those communities, but will affect our ability as an in, uh, as an entire global community to feed ourselves in in a sustainable manner. If we don't prioritize the food systems transformation, the investment in adaptation to to yeah. to support to meet those needs of those uh, who are affected, as I've described, those 500 million smallholder farmers, that will ensure our ability to address the climate challenge as well as the hunger challenge facing so and, many. And I want to come back to the to the climate side of this in a moment, but just briefly staying with the question of uh, basic causes, Matthias, if I may. We have a question that has come in from an audience member, Marjorie G. She says, would having more farmers help? I have the feeling, she says, there are more people needing food than those producing it. And essentially that goes to an often debated question, uh, whether global hunger is about a lack of supply or a lack of access, whether it's a production or rather a distribution crisis. Mm -hmm. What would you say? There is too much or in the food debate. We need to move from the word or to the word end. So all of the above is the answer. Give you a practical example. If you are a farm animal, a mammal in the rich part of the world, you will spend roughly more on food than at least 25% of the world population. So you're a hog in Spain, you invest more as a hog in Spain in food than 25% of the world population. Biofuels, as much as they help to reduce the carbon footprint of our uh, uh, car fleets, biofuels are also kind of uh, one of those things where you can see you'd rather spend it uh, for fuel than for the poorest people in the world because the market kind of sends those signals. So um, we have we, we have to change the way we look at animal husbandry. We have to change the way we look at biofuels, especially in times of crisis. But at the same time, we have to innovate to increase the productivity. The debate about whether extensive parts of the European agricultural land should now be put into use yeah. is a useless debate if we don't have enough fertilizer on the land that is really uh, kind of uh, delivering most of the yield, uh, because without that fertilizer, we don't even use our best lands properly. Um, so what I find really important is everybody who kind of walks into the room with their old ideas should add the word end to everything they're saying. And there was a consensus about the crisis of the food systems at the UN last September, 
there was a consensus about like what should happen in German agriculture last summer. And my fear is in the midst of this crisis, instead of us coming together and really trying to do what's necessary to help reducing the effects of what uh, Antonio Guterres called a hunger hurricane, we are kind of debating it in the old ways. And of course, innovation will play a key role and access to innovation for smallholders is one of the most crucial things we need to ensure. Uh, what I'm probably most proud of uh, when I look at the 2021 performance of Bayer is that we have been able to reach almost half, um, half of our 100 million target. We've been able to reach 50 million smallholder farmers and we have helped them to at least feed 10, if not 20 people. And that is how I look at this. So um, the technology is something we need to put in the hands of those people to help them to lift themselves out of this dire situation, rather than just thinking about sending them food aid. Perhaps the last topic I want to raise, we haven't talked about it yet. Most countries, not only the rich countries in the north, are running out of cash. They are really hurting from the pandemic. Yeah, they yeah. don't have the money mm -hmm. to either buy food or in the case of countries like Argentina to buy the inputs to grow food. That's why the IMF and the World Bank should spend a lot of time thinking about what they can do to kind of help this food crisis to not run into an uncontrolled hurricane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, been a major topic of the chief economist at the World Bank, who is warning of a major debt crisis across the global south. Um, let let me come back to the point that Matthias just made about uh, the discussion that's going on here in Europe on the idea of uh, becoming more independent, more autarkic when it comes to food, and therefore, as he said, taking more land into agricultural production. In some way, Erthren, it measures, it, it, it mirrors the debate that we're seeing in, in Europe right now about energy independence, that in general, there's a sense that uh, Europe perhaps needs to become more autonomous uh, in, in a variety of different sectors. Is that actually an answer, do you think, when it comes to food? The, the the challenge that we have is we have a global food system today because we as a community embrace the concept that we should grow food where it grows best and then trade for that food to ensure that everyone has access to the food that is necessary. Because in in the to, to suggest that we can we can uh, support the diets of nine and a half billion to ten billion people by 2050 without a robust global trading system that's supported by rules to ensure fairness across that system. Uh, that we can that we can feed that population without that system in place is one that m m agricultural economists across the globe will tell you that it's challenging, if not impossible. And the the we while we speak and talk about the 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 the, the challenges of of where we should farm expansion of uh, lands under cultivation to support an increasing population. As Matisse has underscored in several of his comments, we don't use productively the land that we are cultivating today. And we have a challenge of, of 3 billion people who can't afford a diverse and nutritious diet as we are speaking today. And as we recognize that we'll need to increase, and some would argue even double the amount of food that we would produce by 2050 to support that nine and a half billion population. And so the so the the, the debate about the about food sovereignty um, is one that intellectually is is quite compelling 
but realistically to ensure that it's not us versus them when we talk about how we how we how food is made available across the globe is not uh, i would argue not only practical but almost inhum inhumane or, and and because we can see the potential challenges that it would create in those places where people cannot afford enough food and where we with the investments that are necessary in production in uh, in in fertile and uh, uh, locations across the globe, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, we could produce more food by providing more of the inputs that are necessary to support the increase of production by farmers already cultivating rich lands and soils and support the economic opportunities that are necessary across those populations through a trade-based a rules-based trading system that would allow us to provide for the food security, not only of, of those populations, but also of European populations. And I, I, the, the, I am one who would always argue we must cultivate land, we must in, in a manner that meets our environmental needs as well as our human health needs and provides for the economic return to all of the actors across the food system, from farmer to retailer to investor. And that is possible, but only if we recognize the limits of our planet and not make decisions that detrimentally would affect other parts of the world in their ability either to cultivate food or access affordable food. Again, that systemic perspective. Matthias, let me also ask you to pick up on that point uh, and on a, a point that you raised uh, a moment ago. Uh, even before this current crisis, policymakers in the EU were facing the challenge of triangulating the goals of making the agricultural system more sustainable while simultaneously fostering global food security. Do you think that this new crisis is going to influence that debate and also the perspective about, about that balance? I absolutely believe that will happen. Uh, we have seen the pandemic changing a lot of perceptions uh, in the population about lots of topics, including uh, vaccination, including uh, their willingness to welcome new technology, in this case, the mRNA vaccines. Yes, there is a minority who stubbornly doesn't like it, but the vast majority has been very welcoming. Uh, we will see similar effects uh, in this hunger crisis. But what's important is that we are able to do both things at the same time, that we avert the worst of the crisis that is coming and accelerate the transformation of our food system. Um, and. Uh, we, we should avoid to mix that in an unproductive way. I give you the example of fertilizer. Bayer doesn't produce fertilizer, so we are not in the business of fertilizer production, but our customers need fertilizer to be successful. It's the only way for them at the moment to provide enough plant nutrition. In the long run, I believe that fossil fuel-based fertilizer will be replaced by biological solutions. Gene editing will help. We will talk a lot about soil microbes. I think there will be a huge transformation and we need to make sure this transformation happens. But one shouldn't start a conversation about how bad fertilizers are in the midst of an impending food shortage for all the reasons we discussed on the, on the call today. So this right. is kind of how I'd like this conversation to go. So let's talk about the EU Green New Deal. It's not a question of whether or not we want to have the EU Green New Deal. The question is whether a paradigm of extensivation of we produce less in Europe and import more from Ukraine or from other places is the right paradigm or whether we are able to decarbonize agriculture to increase biodiversity and at the same time increase productivity. For that, Europe needs to welcome innovation, but it's certainly possible to do that. So. If you really want to rescue the Green New Deal, which I think we need to, um, it has never been more um, uh, to date than now to, to increase independence from fossil fuels in Europe. 
But if we want to rescue this, we need to question certain paradigms. And that's my hope that we kind of integrate both views and come up with great solutions, because that's what humans usually do when they master a crisis. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of audience questions coming in, so let me pose one of them to you, Earthrin, if I may. And uh, it is basically the question of which countries are most at risk as a result of the current crisis. You're thinking on that. And the same questioner, Darren Willis uh, Wallace, uh, asks, and are there public-private partnerships that you believe could address this issue? So two-pronged question. Well, thank you. That that uh, and thank the audience member for that question. The the when we think about the conflict in the Ukraine, the those countries that are net importers from Ukraine, as FAO pointed as noted in their report, are the at the tip of the sword of those who are potentially in, affected by the crisis. Of course, that's um, the Middle East, primarily Egypt, uh, the in, in North Africa, and Turkey, and we've all, as I noted, we've already seen the beginnings of protest in Iraq as a as a importer from the Ukraine. But the what 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 Matthias and I have been uh, <clears throat> talking about this morning is the the broader impact of the poten broader potential impact impact that not the, the that it will affect those countries that are not necessarily uh, the importers from Ukraine, but are impacted by the war because of the, its tipping point effect on all of these other issues that we've been talking about today. And those, um, those Issues that, like the issue of fertilizer that Matthias was just talking about, the the issue of import export restrictions that affect net importing countries that are reeling from high food prices today because of COVID uh, and the aftermath of COVID and low. Uh, sovereign wealth and low economic stability in those countries because of the cost of COVID to low and middle income countries. That broader effect of, of, of this high food price price crisis driven by the by the by the conflict will affect countries across sub-Saharan Africa it will affect countries in Asia but it will also affect and we we talked and we touched on this those countries that are presently in conflict and already on the verges of uh, on the brink of of of, hung, of of starvation, as David Beasley also says, this could push us into a position where he is taking food from the hungry to feed the starving, um, mm -hmm. and creating ever more a crisis in those places where you have those 285 million people who are critically food insecure, but not yet in the 45 million number of those who are facing famine because of conflict. We will see those, we will witness those numbers increasing as a result of lack of access to the commodities that are necessary because over 50% of the food that is distributed by WFP comes from the Ukraine. And the effect that the, the, the conflict has on high food prices is affecting the ability of the organization that was all already imploring the world for increased investment to, to purchase the food that is necessary to support the populations that are required. So one of the issues that we haven't talked about as well, that Matthias and I often speak with political officials across the globe, there are food stocks available. Many, there are a number of countries that are holding food stocks. We need to ensure that those companies, countries begin to release those food stocks to the WFP in particular to support their ability to feed those populations so that we don't see those numbers being driven up in places far afield from Ukraine and 
far afield from an importer from Ukraine, but affected by the crisis. And so when you talk about public-private partnerships, much of what you just heard Matthias um, uh, explain about the work of, an, of of Bayer to invest in smallholder farmers. That is so critical to ensuring that the, the capital is there to support farmers' access to those inputs that are necessary. And as we think, be just the, think beyond the challenge of um, this crisis to ensuring the resilience of farmers by providing them with those inputs, we are we are, um, there are all kinds of new tools coming online to support increased productivity, whether they're digital or biological tools. We need to ensure that the private sector and the public sector work together so that those new tools are not just available to affluent farmers in the north, but they're available to those 500 million smallholder farmers that support, that will ensure the ability of those countries to continue to feed themselves. Because when we talk about smallholders, mm -hmm. in most countries around the world where smallholder, far small, far smallholder farmers are the backbone of the agriculture system, they produce 80% of the food that is required in those countries. So the public-private partnership yeah. to ensure the change in their ability to produce is quite critical to addressing mm -hmm. this, the challenges of food insecurity. And Thank you very much. Let me Darren's, bring, yes. To Darren's yeah, question, um, what I find very inspiring is the work that has that Paul Pullman has done after um, he retired, and he says he, he doesn't like the word retiring in that case, uh, from his uh, position as CEO of Unilever. So he has basically organized a food collective and they have spent the better part of the last two years to kind of bring together leading players in the food system on the industry side. Actually, they're going to meet this weekend in order to make sure that on the industry side, we are coordinated and we are able to help the World Food Program, to help governments, to kind of move in the right direction quickly. Uh, so, yes, not only is there work on public-private partnership, I don't think without public-private partnership we stand a chance to avert the worst of this food crisis. Matthias, I also have uh, a comment uh, from Gunther Welz, uh, who I, I think uh, probably also is a colleague uh, from Bayer. He says, while it is critical to secure staple crop production, it's also key to reverse the global trend of increasing meat consumption. Opening up alternative protein sources has become very critical, and this is something where we as Bayer can contribute. Do you want to say a word about that? Again, we need to look at long-term, short-term. So in the long run, I believe that the demand of meat will slow down the demand growth if we invest in plant-based proteins and also in cultured meat solutions. Bayer, for example, has invested in a lot of companies in the, in the cultured uh, meat and plant-based protein space in order to prepare for this change. In the short term, I'm skeptical that the meat consumption will um, uh, uh, recline or, or recede. And the reason why that is, um, is that more and more people move into that space of like middle class. And in most countries, India perhaps being a laudable uh, uh, exemption here for cultural reasons, in most countries that goes hand in hand with increased meat consumption. I was actually very happy to see that the Chinese government um, announced uh, uh, a strategy to supplement some of their meat demand with plant-based proteins and with cultured meat. Uh, this will happen in many countries. It will slow down the demand growth for meat, but it will not turn it around uh, when you just look at uh, how humans behave. And that is why it is so important that we are realistic about what's possible, especially what's possible in the short term um, uh, uh, on this topic. And let me come back to the short term um, and picking up on something you said at the outset of our discussion when you talked about what can we do to address uh, this impending uh, crisis due to the conflict in Ukraine. You said, well, one thing is to 
uh, try to uh, ensure that the conflict is of short duration. So let me ask you, and I know it's a sensitive topic, but we have seen a flock of companies taking positions on the war and on their ties to the Russian economy. And I'd like to ask about Bayer's position on that and whether the country in fact will remain active in Russia. We, we, we were, um, uh, first of all, looking at medicines. And uh, we took very early on a decision that uh, cancer patients, people who suffer from acute coronary diseases and so on, um, uh, in Russia should have access to medicines. Just because Putin decided to wage an inhumane war doesn't mean that we need to turn into inhumane people. Yeah? So I think access to medicines should not be in question. And then we face the more difficult question, and that is, should we support the 2022 harvest in Russia, or should we slow down, if not stop our activities? And we have decided to support it, and the reason being that Russia is such an important wheat producer, they may not deliver their wheat into, uh, into uh, Africa or the Middle East, but they now reopen their markets with China. And that may reduce China's demands in other places, which will then enable a country like Egypt to buy wheat on the global market. That was our thinking. But we also said, without peace, there won't be a 2023 harvest supported by Bayer. So in the acute situation, we decided, even if we are criticized, we do that. In the long run, uh, we do not believe that, that, that we can have a have a business um, with a regime that uh, 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 yeah kind of commits the atrocities we all see on live TV. By the way, that's one of the problems. We all see the atrocities on live TV. We do not see the hunger crisis in Yemen. If you just yeah. look at the numbers, the media impressions, most people starve to death without us even noticing. During the pandemic, the number of people starving to death increased and we ignored it. It wasn't a big topic for us. FFP2 masks were much more important than a girl in Yemen starving to death. And, and we have to look at those people, we have to cover them, and we have to make sure that we do both, help the people in Ukraine and focus on the world's most vulnerable in other places who are sentenced to death by famine as a result of the war in Ukraine. That topic about visibility and trade-offs is one that takes me uh, to uh, one last issue that I'd like to, uh, to drill a bit deeper on, and that's climate change together with hunger, that nexus, something that in fact, uh, Matthias, we've often talked about in these uh, LinkedIn Live debates. I have one uh, comment that was sent in by Robert Mwanaki Nidaru from Kenya, and he says, climate change induced drought is threatening 2.8 million people who are food insecure already in Kenya. So, um, Earthren agriculture uh, is, of course, as you mentioned, one of the sectors most affected by climate change and at the same time, one of its key drivers. You talked about the importance not only of mitigation, but adaptation uh, mm -hmm. in the area of agriculture. Are you concerned that the war in Ukraine and its medium to longer term implications could actually wind up undermining our efforts to mitigate and adapt to the climate crisis, it's almost like the discussion we had at the outset of the pandemic, where mm -hmm. many people had the, the sense that this very immediate crisis we're facing in some ways distracts us from the slower moving, but definitely dramatically urgent climate crisis. The, the simple answer of, is, is yes. Uh, and and the, um, we, we, to your point, uh, in the aftermath of COVID, the global community, as Matthias uh, stated earlier, came together in, 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 the, in support of the United Nations Food Systems Summit and embraced a going, set of going forward strategies to support the investments that were necessary 
to increase agricultural production in the face of a post-COVID world, recognizing that much of that post-COVID world was already <clears throat> impacted by climate. And <clears throat> the entire global community as a part of the Paris Agreement had already committed to the $100 billion that is necessary to support the adaptation, not just of the food system, but of course of the of of of, of the energy system, etc. Cetera, et cetera, that is affected by climate. But the challenge is we've never met those commitments, even before COVID. We recommitted as a global community in the UN Food System Summit, in COP26, in the G7 and G20, to investing in, in a post-COVID world to build back better, to support all of the changes that are necessary across the, the agricultural systems in the developed world to meet the post-COVID challenges of food, uh, of food security. And then we we are moving towards and marching towards this 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 perfect storm of of a high food price crisis that, while has the acute challenges of higher food prices in the global south, we know that it is affected, but it's also affecting uh, consumers in the global north. And as populations begin, as and and pop politicians begin to attempt to address their own food security at home with their with their people, as well as support an ongoing war in Ukraine and the overhang of covid the 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 likelihood of of the global attention focusing on the south of the donor particularly donor countries diminishes by the day and as we as we em, embrace it and are appalled by the 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 media coverage of this war and we uh, as a global community invest in the humanitarian support for those affected by the war we lose ever more we lose sight of the the babies in yemen and the challenges in Ethiopia, and those continue to persist. The smallholder farmers that lack access to fertilizer as the planting season starts, their inability to, to plant and harvest a bounty that will ensure their ability to not only support their livelihoods, but simply to feed their family. That is happening as we speak. So this is not something that we're projecting upon. The question is, will we stop as a global community and realize that we must, yes, address the challenges of Ukraine, yes, address the overhang of the challenges of, of high food prices in our own countries, but we must also uh, support the commitments that we've made as a global community to ensuring that we leave no one behind. Thank you very much. We're just about out of time, but I would like to come to each of you with one short closing question. And I'm, I'm just going to share uh, a comment that we have here from Vidyut Mukherjee. Uh, he's thanking both of you very much for what he calls heart-touching sharing. So let me ask about uh, the, the state of your hearts, as it were. Matthias knows that I'm a great admirer of his, uh, his persistent optimism, and today's no exception, Matthias. Mm -hmm. We have a war in the heart of Europe, we have brain shortages, we have soaring food prices, and we have a pandemic that is still not at an end. In the face of yet another short-term crisis, how do you maintain hope? Well, I think what, what helps me is that I'm absolutely angry how somebody like Putin attempts to derail the world. And where I get my hope from is that I think there are enough people in this world who will not allow Putin to do that. We are not like helpless sheep in the face of a, a, an autocrat like Putin. Um, the ability to come together and to push back is kind of my battery that gives me hope. And Ursula and I have been talking to a lot of people in the last two and a half weeks. Um, and um, just to see how those people come together and rally behind uh, the food crisis, uh, people in high places, dare I say, uh, is a really a source of hope for me. 
And Earthrin, essentially same question to you. What motivates you on days when it seems like the proliferation of crises is almost too much to bear? Well, uh, let me support everything that Matthias has said and 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 say that and particularly underscore the importance of the responses the positive responses that we've received from global leaders of, of in, in 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 as we discuss these issues and the need for action immediate as well as long medium and long term action to support what the crisis is today as well as where we're going that has been so uplifting uh, and it gives you the, the 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 drive to continue to perform this work on a on a daily basis but let me just uh, be very honest and tell you i have an overhang of my own and that is seeing healthy babies when I know we've done the right thing that has made a difference in their lives and they we we don't have babies with bloated stomachs and flies on their eyes because the global community has failed them those are the babies we never see are the ones that where we have 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 coalesced as a global community invested the capital that is necessary provided the resources that are required and ensured that families can feed their children. And that's what gives me hope, is I know it is possible. I know if the work that we have been talking about here today is performed, if the investments are made, that we can, in fact, address this um, impending challenge in a way that we will ensure that there are nothing but fat, healthy babies around the globe. That's very, very nice. And uh, in that work to create those babies, we are also, I think, building peace uh, from all that you said at the outset about the link between hunger and conflict. I was reminded of a statement made by the first director general of the FAO, Lord John Orr, who once said, you can't build peace on empty stomachs. Conversely, you can build peace when you try to help feed people. And I think both of you have made that very, very clear today. We're very grateful to both of you for taking the time to share your insights and your perspective with us. And I'd also like to thank our audience so much for your attention and for your contributions. Uh, great that you could be with us today. We hope to see everybody again soon. And until then, I wish everyone to stay healthy, safe, and hopefully at peace. Thank you.